One of the primary things we do in the laboratory is collect data. I don't know about you, but if I'm required to memorize large amounts of data, I tend to mix up a few things here and there. Because of this, it's generally a good idea to record your data in some form. This can be as simple as writing it down on a piece of paper. However, in our laboratory setting, we're usually gathering data while sitting next to a computer. In addition, often, once we have gathered our data, we need to do some sort of numerical analysis on those data. This is where a tool like Excel comes in. Excel is spreadsheet software. In its most basic sense, it's simply a grid of columns that are referenced by letters and rows that are referenced by numbers. By using a spreadsheet, we can enter data in an orderly and neat fashion. Excel is also a powerful computational and analytical tool, but I'll not go into that in this video. In this video, I'll cover only the data entry, formatting, and computations you'll need for gathering and analyzing basic laboratory data in the context of an introductory circuit modeling course. Since I need some example to start with, let's imagine that for our project, we need to take some resistors, determine their nominal values, and determine if the resistors are in tolerance. I'll begin by creating some column categories like a resistor identifier and the color code shown by its bands. The next column I'll label the nominal resistance. One thing we want to remember when recording data is that we want to keep our values as numeric quantities. We do not want to put units or engineering prefixes directly on our numbers. The reason for this is that we probably want to perform some form of computation on our data. Excel will only be able to do this if we are careful to only enter numeric values into the cells. Units are absolutely necessary for each and every quantity. So I'm going to suggest that we put the units for the quantities in the column header. That unit will then apply to all numbers in that column. Since we are dealing with resistances, our unit will be ohms, represented by the capital Greek letter omega. To put a Greek letter in the column header, go to the Insert tab, click on Symbol, click on Insert, and click Close. The tolerance will be a percent, but I will take care of that when I enter the tolerances. For ease of interpretation, let's make columns for the lower and upper bounds of the resistances based on the tolerances. Next, let's make a column for the measured resistances. And finally, a column that will state whether the measured value was in the tolerance range. With all the headers entered, I'll resize the columns so we can see the words. If we highlight the columns and move the cursor until we see the black line with arrows out of each side, double-clicking will resize the column to fit their contents. I'm going to choose to reference the resistors as resistors 1 through 10. The first will be R1, the second R2, etc. In reports and tables, when we have several occurrences of the same variable denoted by a letter that differs by a designator, it is best to subscript that designator, in this case, the numeral. It's best because it looks cleaner. To subscript, after R1 is typed, highlight the 1, click on the Show Dialog icon on the Font section, and click Subscript. I'll do the same for R2. Once the pattern is established, click and drag to fill the, in the column. Excel recognizes the countering pattern and continues it for you. Just for appearance sake, I'm going to center the rows and columns. This is done by highlighting the spreadsheet and by clicking in the upper left-hand corner and then clicking on the appropriate alignment icons in the Home tab. For the color codes, I'm just going to copy and paste some values. I can then move on to entering the nominal resistances and the tolerance from the color code. Scientific and engineering quantities often have a very large range. So we use engineering or scientific notation to handle numbers. So rather than writing 1 million as 1 followed by 6 zeros, we will write something like 1.0 times 10 to the 6th. In Excel, this would be done by typing 1E6. The first color code is red, black, brown, gold. This represents a 2 zero followed by a multiplier or power of 1 with a 5% tolerance. To handle powers in Excel, use the letter E. So the number is entered as 20E1, which is equal to 200. For the tolerance, type 5%. The percent sign is interpreted by Excel as a data format rather than a symbol. Brown, green, gold is 15 followed by a multiplier of negative 1 with a 5% tolerance. Brown, black, green, gold is 10 followed by a multiplier of 5 with a 5% tolerance. Orange, 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 gold is 33E3 
with a 5% tolerance. Brown black, black gold is 10E0 with a 5% tolerance. Brown red, brown, black brown is 121E0 with a 1% tolerance. Brown black, red silver is 10E2 with a 10% tolerance. Green brown, orange gold is 51E3 with a 5% tolerance. Blue gray, red gold is 68E2 with a 5% tolerance. Red red, green gold is 22E5 with a 5% tolerance. To compute the lower bound, we will take the nominal resistance times the quantity 1 minus the tolerance. I can enter this in by typing equals, selecting the cell that contains the nominal resistance, in this case C2, using the asterisk for multiplication, opening parentheses for the quantity of 1 minus the tolerance in cell D2, close the parentheses, and hit enter. The upper tolerance is calculated in a similar manner. After typing the equal sign, I will select the cell containing the nominal resistance, use the asterisk for multiplication, open parentheses for the quantity 1 plus the tolerance in cell D2, and close the parenthesis before hitting enter. To copy the formula to the rest of the cells, highlight E2 and F2. Move the cursor to the lower right-hand corner of the cells. When the cursor changes to a dark plus sign, double-click to copy the formula to the remaining cells. Before I enter in values for the measured resistances, let's make a formula that will state whether the resistor is in tolerance or not. We want to check that the resistance is between the upper and lower bounds of the range specified by the tolerance, including the endpoints. This will be a logical equation for Excel. We want to know if something is true. An if statement in Excel will be of the general form if, open parentheses, logical test, comma, the value if it's true, and the value if it's false, separated by a comma with a closed parenthesis at the end. What we want to know is if the measured resistance is equal or greater than the lower bound, and if the measured value is less than or equal to the upper bound. To implement this logical function, we will type the equal sign if parentheses and parentheses to check that the cell is above the lower tolerance, select the cell containing the measured resistance, in this case G2, use a greater sign, equal sign, this performs the greater than or equal function, and then the cell containing the lower bound value in E2. A comma will separate the first logical test from the second, and then we will enter the equation to see if the measured resistance is less than or equal to the upper bound by typing G2 less than equal F2. After this, we'll put what we want the function to return if the result is true or false. The simplest would be to use yes to indicate yes and no to indicate no. For Excel to interpret something as text, we need to put it in quotation marks. So I will type yes in the quotation marks, followed by a comma, and no in quotation marks. After closing the parenthesis, the equation is done and can be copied. I'm just going to make up some measured resistances, making sure at least one of them is out of tolerance to demonstrate the tolerance function. At this point, we have our data. If we want to submit these data, we can save the spreadsheet as a PDF and submit it to the Dropbox in Desire to Learn. Often, however, we will want to put these data in a Word document for a laboratory project report. When I made the spreadsheet, I didn't pay much attention to the formatting. Let's copy the table to Word and take care of it there. If I highlight the cells in Excel, I can copy the cells, go to Word and paste them. They do not fit on the page. I can use the column width tool to do some preliminary resizing, but this isn't going to be very efficient. A more efficient approach might be to select the whole table by clicking on the cross symbol in the upper left hand corner, right clicking, and under auto fit, select auto fit to window. This rarely works perfectly, but it will get us into the ballpark. We can then do some necessary touch-ups. It is not acceptable to have a single word that spans more than one line. However, it may be acceptable to have multiple lines per cell. This is adjusted by dragging the vertical cell boundary until a column is the correct size. I'll continue to drag and resize cells until there are no broken words, while the table still fits on the page. Once I'm happy with how the lines break, I can continue with typing my Word document. There is a lot more that can be done with Word in Excel, 
This video is not meant to be an introduction to those tools. Excel and Word are both powerful and versatile tools, and I haven't even scratched the surface as far as they're concerned. But right now, I hope you have a basic grasp on one way to efficiently enter data into a spreadsheet. The main things to avoid are putting the units directly on each number, and not to use the engineering prefixes for units when entering the numbers into the spreadsheet. This allows us to use the most basic functionality of the spreadsheet, the ability to do calculations. That's all for today. Go out and make it a great one.